There is a period of time in the history of this world that is well known by name, but what happened during this period is not known. Other than the period that we're in today, in my research of the history of this world, I have not found a more deceptive time in the world than I have found in the period of the Renaissance. This is a period in time that was used by Satan in order to set up his agenda and put forth his plans to change the world. After this time period in the world, truth was redefined and our modern world was truly created. Every time you search and seek to find out where a certain major lie came into the public view, I challenge you that you will find that the main setups and lies were started during the period of the Renaissance. If you have ever visited Rome, I'm sure that this overwhelming reality will hit you like a bag of bricks. You go there searching for history, and at every turn, you see that history was remade during the Renaissance. So all places you would look for for history was remade and recreated, and they became what we know today. The period of the Renaissance affects us all because those who held power in this world use this time period to begin a transformation that the whole world will be affected from. When we think of the Renaissance, the first thing people want to think of is probably art and culture. And while yes, this is definitely a part of the change, it is vastly far more deeper than that. I've said a lot of things over time in this ministry and I've taken a lot of slack because things that I see clearly are not that clear for many others. And that is simply due to a lack of information. There are important subjects that need to be understood, and this period of the Renaissance must be dealt with. I was planning on dealing with the Protestant Reformation after the video about the Templars, but Father told me to slow down and really explain things. I really want to provide intellectual clarity on subjects that seem to be hidden from our mainstream view. The period of the Renaissance is a period in time that truth became edited, and if you want to understand our enemy, I'm going to show you how deep this all is. As we go into the period of the Renaissance, before we can jump into the many changes that occurred at this point in history, we need to discuss a topic that is not very well known and heard of in our modern day. And we must bring back up the Templars of which we spoke about in the last video. Today, when we talk about conspiracies, everyone likes to bring up the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. I know I do, but that's because today in our modern world, they are some of the most important families that are in our main view that we know of. It's important to understand that the world we live in is not by accident, but it has been guided through the centuries by those who worship Lucifer. The Rothschild's wealth didn't come out of nowhere. It is wealth and power passed down through the dark powers of this world. In the first part of this series on history that should not be ignored, we discuss the Templars because they are a key figure to understand when understanding the break and split in the church. Again, when they were dissolved, this was the black magic agenda being separated from the white magic. And after the Templars were dissolved, the black magic went underground. This was in the early 14th century. In the history that's told to us, we don't really see these organizations of black magic come back into public view until we get to the 18th century. There are about 400 years of extremely important history that is only spoken about in terms of art and culture that is told in a story about the Renaissance. But there are some important people, important events, and important agendas that must be put into our understanding when we are really trying to really understand this world. During this 400 year gap period, during the Renaissance, the black magic agenda, it did not disappear. It just went underground. And instead of them working through organizations, they worked in plain sight through individuals and families, just as they do today. And in this history, you will find that there is no other family more important and wealthy than the Medici family. A family that came out of nowhere and after the dissolution of the Templars became the European bankers who brought about our modern world through the Renaissance. In order to discuss the Renaissance, you need to be informed about the Medicis and their connection with the Templars. So we're going to discuss something not really taught in the mainstream, but absolutely important if you want to be informed and truly understand the world that you're in. There is a lot more history that cannot be ignored, and that starts with understanding the Medici family. Let's begin. Okay, so when discussing the Renaissance, it's important that I provide some background and clarity. We discussed the history of the Templars in the first part, but let's get some more history about the period before the Renaissance. We often talk about the Roman Catholic Church, but it's important that we talk about the Roman Empire itself for a brief moment. The Roman Empire, 
under the leadership of dozens of Caesars who answered to a democratically elected Senate back in Rome, colonized and occupied Europe, North Africa, and the Near East from about 200 BC to the end of the 5th century AD. Over 700 years, seven centuries. During this time of colonization, Rome oppressed local culture in favor of their own style of civilization. This is very much like the way of the Greeks with Hellenization. They believed they were bringing a superior form of societal organization to the uncultured tribes around them. Basically, our way is the best way, so everyone needs to learn it. Now, if we follow the history of colonizers from Europe, this mindset and attitude has never left, because this is what Americans feel today. But right now, we're talking about Romans. Rome was ruthless when it came to transforming the lands that it conquered. Infrastructure was the first issue that the soldiers of Caesar dealt with once a region or small kingdom came under their control. Once they took a tribe or nation under control, roads were constructed to connect military outposts and community centers, while walls went up to keep out unfriendly locals. The tribes and people of the world that were conquered lost touch with their cultural roots thanks to the vast indoctrination and influence of Roman education and trade. They learned a new way of life through philosophy, literature, new political ideas, and their food. The culture of Rome was spread. And again, this is why when I speak of the Bible, understanding it from a Hebrew mindset, it is so important because we don't understand that we have been conditioned to understand the culture of the Bible through a European mindset that has never been in covenant with Yah. And so therefore, what they have deemed important is what we know. And what they have considered not important and what they have considered something they did not want to do is what we do not know and what we ignore. It's why people want to apply Greek culture to the Hebrews, not really understanding the conflict the people of Judah had with Greece and those of Judah who adapted to the Greek culture. But I digress. Life became very different for all the other nations that came under the rule of the Roman Empire. But this Roman rule wouldn't last forever. Rome had spread itself very thinly across a massive expanse of land, and its enemies eventually gained a foothold. In the 5th century, under the leadership of Odoacer, the Germanic tribes of the northern regions swept in and wrestled control of all of Italy from under Emperor Romulus Augustus. And then, after several decades of struggling to maintain law and trade, most Roman colonies found themselves completely cut off from their longtime center of Roman culture. Rome had fell in the 5th century. There was no date. It was just a fall from power of an empire that overextended itself. Multiple cultural groups reemerged after this. Almost three centuries after this fall of Rome, Emperor Charles Le Magna, Charles the Great, modernized as Charlemagne, emerged as the leader of the Franks while independent Viking raiders took over large sections of Britain and northwestern Europe. There was also a break from Rome in the east. The eastern Roman colonies were formed into the Byzantine Empire, where Greek was the common language. Muslim caliphates conquered the former Roman regions in Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia, reconstructing these places from weak Christian centers into devoted Muslim societies. Modern Portugal and Spain were also heavily invaded by Muslim armies while also having strong Christian communities. And it's important to note that the Yahudim were scattered all through these regions after the fall of Jerusalem. I went through that history in parts 4 through 7 of the Understanding Israel series. And so during these Middle Ages, this was how the political world power was structured. The most defining political feature of Europe in this period was the emergence of dozens of small kingdoms, including that of Germany, Bohemia, Burgundy, the Franks, and Italy. It's also important to note that over in East Europe, this was the time period where the Khazars grew in power and converted to Judaism. I spoke about that in my Hijackers Part 2 video, which is on my website. In the latter half of the 10th century, many of these small realms were politically bound together under the newly emerged Holy Roman Empire. Again, this is one documented reason why the Khazars converted to Judaism because they did not want to come under the power of Rome and be Christians or become held by the Muslim Caliphate and become Muslims. So they chose Judaism, among other darker reasons, obviously. In the year 800, Pope Leo III granted the title of emperor to King of the Franks, Charlemagne, 
and this began the second wave of the Romanization of Western Europe. Emperor Charlemagne's rule began 1,000 years of international accord under the umbrella of the Holy Roman Empire. There was a reconnection of Western and Eastern Europe. This does not include the Byzantine Empire. The kingdoms were connected not only by trade and migration, but by their shared belief in the Catholic Church. This was a Christian empire. By concentrating on their alignment with the church and its pope, European kingdoms grew larger, more powerful, and more prosperous. By requiring tithes, which are mandatory donations, the church became the central power in all Christian Europe and monarchs, by pledging their sword and a portion of their own collected taxes to the Pope, aligned themselves with this power. And so, over this time right here is when we get caught up and the history begins to overlap with what we discussed last week and how the Templars came into power. You see, Rome was rebuilding itself, and in that time, they created the Knights Templar, which came into great power and wealth, second only to the Pope. So let's keep going. When discussing the Renaissance, it's important that we go back to the Templars. As I said in the last video, if I skip the discussion of the Templars, what comes after them would not make a lot of sense. When I ended the history of the Templars, I ended with them being dissolved. Due to an order from King Philip of France, at dawn on Friday, October 13, 1307, all Templars in France were to be seized and placed under arrest by the king's men their common houses placed under royal sequestration, their goods confiscated. Again, not all the Templars were taken, and they went into hiding. I went into the history of them going into Scotland and showing that this is where Freemasonry stems from. But here's the deal. Freemasonry did not come out on the scene until the 18th century. As I alluded to in the intro, there was a 400-year gap between when the Templars were said to be dissolved and when Freemasonry appears. Now, are we to believe that these wealthy, powerful knights that later on, when Freemasonry appears, they continue to show their power? Are we to believe that their power simply went away for 400 years and then just came back up again? Only the ignorant would believe this. This gap in history is important because it is the period where the world suddenly begins to drastically change. Now, please remember, before the Templars were said to be dissolved, they were the most powerful group or order in the world only second to the Pope. They amass great wealth and power with international influence. As I explained, they invented our modern day banking system. They were the first major bankers of the world. It was their system. So as they dissolved, it's important to understand that when I say they dissolved, they didn't die. It's just that the order of the Templars, the group that we know as the Templars, ceased to exist in our knowledge and understanding. So as we know that they dissolved, it's important to understand the power that sprung out of them. And when we do this, we must begin to discuss the most powerful family in Europe that arises after the dissolve of the Templars, who will be the main players in the history of the Renaissance period. This family are the Medicis. Now, before we go there, let's discuss this first. What is the Renaissance? Let me make sure I go over this before I go too deep. Renaissance is the French word for rebirth which is given to a period of time between the 14th and 17th centuries in Europe when there was a marked resurgence in classical art, education, philosophy, architecture, and natural sciences. The former Roman territories, who once lost its pagan culture at the time of the fall of Rome, began to again embrace the writings of ancient Greeks and Romans, and the idea of humanism began. I will define this term humanism later because it's extremely important. The Renaissance is a key era in history as it marked the transitional period from the Middle Ages to our modern times, in which people began to live a more contemporary way of life, a life that has been changing ever since. But it started at this point in time, and it is not spoken of in enough detail in order to really understand what really occurred during this time period. People want to link it to just art and culture, but what it really was is the main beginnings to Satan's plan to bring the world together. And it starts, not by coincidence, after the Templars were said to be dissolved and the black magic power that gained strength through the church when hidden and behind the scenes. The Renaissance began in Italy and quickly spread throughout France, Britain, Spain, Portugal, and Germany. In order to understand this time period, we will start where it began so you can see the evidence of what was behind this movement. 
So back to the Templars. When they were dissolved, the legend of them or history of them became very mysterious. Again, we know that they didn't just dissolve away in history because many of them escaped the conspiracy on Friday the 13th. You need to understand that before they were dissolved, they were in many different parts of Europe. And aside from them moving into Scotland and finding refuge, there were others who blended into society around other parts of Europe like Spain, Portugal, and Italy itself. According to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the final recorded act in the Order's history had been the burning of the last Grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, in March 1314. Within a month of this burning, Pope Clement was dead from a sudden case of dysentery, which is an infection of the intestines that causes diarrhea, containing blood or mucus. By the end of the year, King Philippe was dead as well from causes that are not clear to this day. People believed that both Pope Clement and King Philippe were poisoned by the Templars, which possessed a great expertise in the use of poisons. It is said that there were many refugee knights of the Templar order, ones who escaped the conspiracy. There were many of them who were traveling incognito, blending in with the people, and there were many sympathizers of the Templars that supported them. In regards to King Philippe of France, it's claimed that the Templars cursed his royal line and the rumors of the Templars' mystic powers went down through the centuries that followed after their supposed demise. And in regards to Pope Clement and those French popes, their history was not long-lived, and it seemed very dangerous to be a pope during the 14th century, as they went through about eight popes reigning from France. Anyways, in regards to the Templars, by the 18th century, various secret and semi-secret societies were claiming the Templars as both their precursors or their foundations claiming the Templars as those who mystically initiated them. The main one being the Freemasons, of course. Also with the Hospitaller Knights, later called Knights of Malta. The Knights Templar merged into other Knights Orders. And so, I'm not trying to do another video about them. As I said, I did not want to devote the time. But what I'm trying to display is that from the 14th century to about the end of the 17th century, the Templars ceased to exist in the public eye but they went into hiding and passed down their secrets and their magic through their secret societies. And it is this important understanding that needs to be had when understanding the history of the world. When we discuss Rome and its history, we very easily can see them and their well-documented history. But what I'm trying to get people to understand is that there was a hidden element working in the world at the most transformational time in history. And although their influence is hard to document because that is what a secret society is about. They move in secret. It's hard to document secrets. It's easy to see that after this period of the Renaissance went forth, that the doctrine, the secrets, the wealth, and the agenda of the Templars was well-founded in the world with strength. And so after the Renaissance, you will see that they sprung up in the world with strength in the 18th century when Freemasonry finally publicly appears. The Bavarian Illuminati is also created. America is founded through what we call the American Revolution. Many things happen after this period of the Renaissance. But how we got to this point in the 18th century through the period of the Renaissance is not widely known. And this is what I'm trying to educate you on. You can't understand the history of this world while ignoring the major players in this world. You cannot ignore the influence of these secret societies. For you to understand that point, I want you to understand how it all works. And so I'm going to jump ahead in history to this figure right here. Leonardo da Vinci. I use him because he's well known. We know this man by his art, creating works like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Now this man was well known and in the public. To the rest of the world, during his time and our time today, he would be known as an artist. But what was not known is that he was a member of a secret society that met in the dark. In fact, he was not only a member, but a Grand Master. He is recorded as being a Grand Master of the Priory of Sion from the years of 1510 to 1519. He was a garter of secrets. But the public did not know this, nor did the church. The church were the ones who they were hiding from. Well, at some point, they were not hiding any longer because they infiltrated much of the Roman church. But that's another subject we'll get to later. They were able to move through a society knowing they had secret goals, but to the public, they were just geniuses or just well-regarded men. And this is how secret societies work, still to this day, actually. 
men that are well regarded and highly known but have secrets. This is why even though you have all these Masonic lodges in all these major cities, you'll never see a window that you can see through in their lodge. But let's keep going. Let's get back to Italy. Florence, Italy specifically. Florence, Italy is an important place of history. During the times of the Templars in the 13th century, the Templars had an outpost in Florence. An outpost is a small military camp or position at some distance from the main force. Remember, Jerusalem was the headquarters of the Templars. In Florence, there was a rich concentration of small Templar churches and hospitals used for shelter, often located near the city walls or in areas that favored those who were traveling. One of those bases or outposts being the Church of San Jacopo and Campo Corbellini. This church still stands to this day. This was the Templar church. After the dissolution of the Templars, it was eventually passed on to the Knights of St. John, which is known as now the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Rhode. If you notice, the church, they still have the Templar cross emblem. It's important to know that after their dissolution, the Templars merged with these other knight orders like I said earlier. And I'm highlighting this because of this next subject, the Medici family. Because they are the current owners of this Church of San Giacopo in Florence right now. The Medici family were a powerful and influential family in Florence, Italy, from the 14th to 17th century. The Medici family, or the House of Medici, were a prestigious Italian banking family and political dynasty who held great power in Florence. Have you ever heard of the Medici Bank? More than likely, probably not. But this family was one of the wealthiest families in Europe, and they were the main financiers of the Renaissance period, a period that changed the world. So by consequence, this family helped change the world. There would be no Renaissance without them, being that they were the bank. This wealthy, important family should be off the tip of our tongues when we understand this world. But it's obviously not, and there's reason for this. Now here's the thing. The history of the Medici family coming to power is very obscure and lacks a lot of detail because they were said to be at once a family of peasants. But the Medici family appear in Florence at the beginning of the 13th century. This is at the same time as the Templars arrived in Florence and created their outpost. During this time, the Medicis were said to be a very humble means. It wasn't until the 14th century after the public demise of the Templars that we see the Medici family rise in power. Little is known about the early ancestry of the Medici family tree. Historians have pondered whether the original family profession was a medical one, as Medici in Italian means doctors. I personally believe that this name is taken on from the fact that they come from the Knights of Malta, which were once the Hospitallers, who again merged with the Templars. The Knights of Malta were a medical order. The history of the Medici's power is said to start in the beginning of the 15th century under Cosimo de Medici. In the early 1400s, the head of the Medici family was named Cosimo. The Medicis were very active in the politics of Florence, but they almost always remained in the background. They were the wealthiest family in the city, but Cosimo's father, Giovanni de Bici de Medici, who was an Italian banker and founder of the Medici Bank, and Christopher Hibbert's book, The House of Medici, on page 40, he writes what Giovanni told his son Cosimo on his deathbed. Do not appear to give advice, but put your views forward discreetly in conversation. Be wary of going to Palazzo del Signoria, the town hall. Wait to be summoned, and when you are summoned, do what you're asked to do, and never display any pride should you receive a lot of vote. Avoid litigation and political controversy, and always keep out of the public eye. This is the teaching of being the hidden hand. They came from the background of being influential, but not being in the public eye. And therefore, this is one reason why we don't hear about them when history is being discussed. But if you do a simple Google search of the Medici family, you will see that they were highly influential, one of the richest families in Europe and the major influence of the Renaissance period. So we should not ignore their influence. So like I started with the history of the Medici's power, it's said to start in the beginning of the 15th century under Cosimo de' Medici. But I personally believe this is history's way of telling us to ignore how the Medicis came into power. Because at the time of Cosimo, they already had power, they already had the bank. 
Cosimo's father was the real power player. Giovanni Medici started the Medici Bank. The Medici Bank was a financial institution created by the Medici family in Italy from the later 14th century to 15th century. It was the largest and most respected bank in Europe during its prime. There are some estimates that the Medici family was for a period the wealthiest family in Europe. With this monetary wealth, the family acquired political power initially in Florence and later in wider spheres of Italy and in Europe. Now, as we research the history of this family, like I said, how they came into this amount of wealth is not really spoken of except them being merchants. The reason I have went into more detail about the Templars is because I personally believe some of the Templar fortune that was mysteriously taken as they vanished from history went into the hands of the Medici family. For instance, remember that church of Florence that was once an outpost for the Templars? The church of San Giacopo in Campo Corbellini that I spoke about being a nice Templar church? This church was passed on to the Knights of St. John, which we know the Medici family was a part of. But the church still exists today, and it's owned by the Medici family, with them having a Medici chapel there. If you remember, the Templars are the creators of our modern-day banking system. After they dissolve from public history, it is not a coincidence that at the end of the century, this family sprouts up with enormous wealth and becomes the largest bank in Europe during the period of the Renaissance. These Templars came back out in the public view, but just as wealthy men. Their true religious beliefs were held in secret, and this is why they didn't want any attention. Giovanni started his career in banking under the family name Medici and rose fast through the ranks, soon becoming junior partner in the bank's branch in Rome. Giovanni officially named and founded the Medici Bank in 1397, by which time he was handling the accounts of the Roman church it had branches throughout northern Italy and beyond. The Medici Bank opened branches in Rome, Geneva, Venice, and temporarily in Naples. Giovanni worked hard to remain disconnected from the state and its politics, choosing to pay fines rather than accept positions of responsibility within the Florentine government. Furthermore, he made diligent efforts not to separate the Medici family from its fellow citizens, dressing himself and his sons in average working-class clothes, so as not to draw attention to themselves. Yet behind the scenes, Giovanni was setting his family on the path to becoming one of the richest dynasties in Europe. On his deathbed, he was the second richest man in Florence and unusually well regarded by his fellow citizens, becoming a favorite amongst the Florentine public following his death. And so when you understand our modern day banking system and understand that the Templars created our modern day banking system and you understand that before they were dissolved, they were spread all throughout Europe it is not a mystery how they then became a bank. When people like to talk about the Templar treasure, they like to say that it mysteriously disappeared like nobody knows where all this money went. And that's just ridiculous. They know where the money went. They just don't want to document the control. Anyways, this is how they were able to have a bank all throughout Europe, the Medici Bank in Europe, because they had Templar agents all throughout Europe. Giovanni is known as the founder of the Medici Bank. But as I said, when discussing history, the power of the Medicis doesn't really start until discussing his son, Cosimo. Cosimo became the head of the Medici family and the head of the Medici bank. So let's go more into the history. The Roman church at this time in the early 15th century, when Cosimo took charge of the bank, was in deplorable condition. This is at the time of what is called the Western Schism, also known as the Papal Schism. This was a split within the Catholic Church lasting from 1378 to 1417 in which bishops residing in Rome, Italy, and Avignon, France, both claimed to be the true Pope. This goes back to the Knights Templar history. If you remember from part one, King Philippe, between 1303 and 1305, him and his ministers engineered the kidnapping and death of one Pope, Pope Boniface VIII, and quite possibly the murder by poison of another. Pope Benedict XI. Then in 1305, Philippe managed to secure the election of his own candidate, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, to the vacant papal throne. The new pontiff took the name Pope Clement V. Pope Clement V was the first Avignon Pope. The Avignon Papacy was the period from 1309 to 1376, during which seven successive popes resided in Avignon rather than in Rome. So if you understand the Roman church during the 14th century, its power resided in France 
not in Rome, which is why and how the Templars, among many other places, found refuge in Italy, particularly in Florence. This time period in France with the Avignon Papacy is said to be met upon a curse from the Templars within the line of King Philippe and with the popes. Anyways, in 1376, Gregory XI abandoned Avignon in France and moved his court back to Rome, arriving in January 1377. He died in 1378, and Pope Urban VI was elected from outside the College of Cardinals. This was marked by great conflict with rivals in Avignon who recognized Clement VII, based in Avignon, as their true pope. And over these decades, from 1378 until 1417, there was a great conflict with the powers of Rome. Listen, don't get lost here, please. I know I'm going through a lot of details, but all of this is important. In an attempt to end this great break with the Roman Church, which was dividing Europe into rival camps, a council had been met at Pisa in 1409. This is known as the Council at Pisa. The Council of Pisa attempted to remove both the Roman Pope Gregory XII and Avignon Pope Benedict XIII, and they wanted to elect a new Pope, Alexander V. But no one wanted to agree to the solution, and so there were now three Popes. Shortly after, Alexander V died and was succeeded by John XXIII. All these names are ridiculous to me. The Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at that time was Emperor Sigismund of Germany. He summoned a new council at Constance in 1414 to end the Papal Schism. And in this recorded history, it was at this time when Pope John XXIII left for Constance, and he took with him a representative of the Medici Bank as his financial advisor. You see, by this time, the Medici were well established as the Pope's bankers, but they had a setback. Pope John was accused of many crimes, including heresy and murder by poison of Alexander V. Both him and the Avignon Pope Benedict XIII were removed from their office, and the Roman Pope Gregory XII resigned. They elected the new Pope, Martin V, who was also living in Florence at the time where the heart of the Medici's power was. Martin V's election to Pope ended the schism, and eventually he went back to Rome. He died in the year 1431 and was succeeded by Pope Eugene IV. And it is at this time where we see the major changes in the Renaissance begin. It is at this time that the Medici family are the bankers of the papal system. Cosimo takes power of the Medici bank and the family. For the next 30 years, Cosimo Medici managed political affairs in Florence. During that time, he worked most often behind the scenes as his father advised him. As one friend observed, as quoted in the House of Medici, whenever he wished to achieve something, he saw to it in order to escape envy as much as possible, that the initiative appeared to come from others and not from him. A contemporary historian observed, he had a reputation such as probably no private citizen has enjoyed from the fall of Rome to our day. So let's talk about him. Through his relationship with the Pope, Cosimo was able to use his influence to bring the 17th Ecumenical Council to Florence. This council was one of the most important church conferences that was had in several centuries. It was a general council of the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. The council was attended by bishops, archbishops, and cardinals from all the important cities of Europe and the Mediterranean and the East. The Pope, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the Eastern Roman Emperor all were in attendance under the invitation of Cosimo Medici to have it in Florence. Hope sprang from the council, but later squashed. But there were lasting effects from this council. First off, Cosimo, like I said, he became the banker to the Pope, and therefore all money from the Vatican flowed through the Medici Bank. All the ties that were taken that supported the church went through the Medici Bank. And this was throughout the Holy Roman Empire, not just through Italy. From this conference, several of the Greek scholars who had traveled with the Eastern Emperor were persuaded to remain in Florence and continue their instruction in classical Greek and on the study of Plato. Plato was now being used in philosophy over Aristotle. This was a part of the humanist movement. I will have to get to that in the next video. Cosimo was so taken with Plato that he founded a Platonic Academy in Florence. 
You see, it was at this point in time that the Medici family really established themselves as the most wealthy family in Europe, and they financed the Renaissance. They did this through being the financers and major supporters of spreading the humanist movement. This was a movement which made the Protestant Reformation possible. The Renaissance is known as a rebirth, and history likes to display it as a rebirth of Rome, but it's much deeper than that. It was rebirth of the time where they would begin to go back to their great work that ended at Babel. The Renaissance was a period that began the Templars rebuilding the world into the secular order of the ages that we are seeing today. They brought back their pagan culture, which contained their pagan religious powers. They were bringing it back into the light and for the public to consume. Through the Medici family, they began the financing of and promotion of the radical ideas that are now prevalent in society today. The Renaissance started in Florence and then went on to Rome and then well into Europe. And when this rebirth was completed, in the end, the American Revolution was born from it. But the history is so sketchy from the dissolution of the Templars to the emergence of the Medici family. If you do not search to connect all the dots, you can miss Satan right in the details and just think it's just a movement of rich people. According to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, in 1439, Cosimo Medici began sending his agents all over the world in quest of ancient manuscripts. Then in 1444, Cosimo founded Europe's first public library, the Library of San Marco, and from this began to challenge the church's long monopoly of learning. Cosimo brought in many different and challenging ways of thought like Pythagorean, Gnostic, and Hermetic ideas, and they were translated for the first time it became readily accessible. Cosimo also instructed the University of Florence to begin teaching Greek for the first time in Europe in 700 years. He created an academy of Pythagorean and Platonic studies. And these academies quickly generated a multitude of similar institutions throughout the Italian peninsula, which became strong spreaders of Western esoteric tradition. And from all this which Cosimo started, this is when we see the Renaissance begin. It started with Cosimo Medici and then went on through his children and the Medici family. And if you ever research this independently, what you may not recognize is that this was the Templar wealth being put to use in the secular world in public view. And though it seemed as if they were supporting the church, they began to push the secular changes slowly through society. The Medici family is an important introduction to how our world works today. They were the bankers of Europe during the Renaissance and were highly influential. The families that later took control after them, they drew from the same playbook. And if you can watch and follow how this unseen hand worked during the Renaissance, it may make things easier as you try to understand our modern world and truly how things work. We are told in scripture, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Messiah. That's Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. We are warned against philosophies and traditions of men. But because we have been born into a society that was designed to lead us into a satanic new world, we as a majority have just accepted philosophies and traditions that have nothing to do with Yahuwah and are completely against him. Today, as a majority within the church, we celebrate everything that is against Yahuwah and we practice and follow lies. There is a conspiracy in this world that is now coming together in order to lead us into a new satanic revolution. And this agenda is not new. This plan has been in the working for centuries. You probably can see the falsehoods from the Roman Catholic Church, but what is hidden is how the black magic agenda has slowly crept in our society and influenced our culture, and we don't even recognize it. The period of the Renaissance was a major part of transitioning the world into a doctrine of self and bringing back esoteric traditions that stem from paganism. The world is indoctrinated into the occult, and we don't even know it. Understanding this history can help open your eyes and wake you up to the difference between how the word tells us to be versus how the world tells us to be. Right now, Christianity is completely bottled up being led by white and black magic and people don't even recognize it. They practice affirmations. They practice pagan holidays. They focus on wealth and fulfilling their own purpose. They reject the most high standards and his ways and believe that they will be accepted by him regardless. I am making this content not for the world, but for those who are waking up and making the Most High Yah their foundation. We are going to go through lies and reject them all. The more falsehoods we can identify in our history, the freer we will be. 
you must remember, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in Yahuwah. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to Yah, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Messiah will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of Yah is. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 17. If you have taken my advice and are reading your Bible diligently, this history will also help awaken you to the darkness in this world, and it will help you walk circumspectly so that you are not fools, but you are wise and you are redeeming the time. We are preparing for Yah's kingdom, and therefore we will no longer be in the darkness, but we will expose it. So continue to grow in your faith. Continue to grow more in wisdom and understanding. And please walk in a swagger today that knows completely who lifts you up and sustains you. These are our days to redeem. This is our future that awaits us. So reject the lies and walk in confidence of the promises Yah has assured us of and live for him. And you will be ready for his day. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like this and share this video with others. This history is very important. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Yah willing, I upload every Friday. Also, don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. To all of you watching, thank you. I'm very thankful for all of you. Thank you especially to those Yah has placed it on your hearts to give and you have done so. Thank you and your assistance in carrying out this ministry every week. Thank you for your blessings and your prayers. I ask for your continued prayers as things are being taken up a notch. Your prayers and support truly hold up this ministry. You have no idea. Thank you for being a blessing. Okay, thanks again everyone for watching. I love you all.